Thank you very, very much, Alice. And, um, and to Arctic Circle and the organizers for inviting me. I'm, I'm very, very honored to be here. So um, let's think about those two words just for a second, cooperation and innovation, because in my mind, they, they really go together. Um, cooperation leads to innovation. And in the Arctic, we see that time and time again. So really what I'm going to talk about here are, well, where does this cooperation happen? And I'm going to talk kind of at a high level about that, give some examples. And then at the end, we'll try to sum up a little bit and think about some ideas moving forward. I guess um, one, uh, one way to put this is, Alice promised you the kitchen sink. I think I'm going to deliver the kitchen sink. So we'll see how all this goes. So where did all this come from, Arctic cooperation? Well, I like to give credit where credit is due. And, and nearly 30 years ago, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev gave a speech in Murmansk. And that speech was uh, pretty groundbreaking. Um, and what really everyone seized on at the moment of the speech was that he suggested that there needed to be uh, uh, discussions about nuclear proliferation. And of course, that was big news. But in addition, he also suggested that there needed to be collaboration and cooperation on Arctic issues. Now, that news wasn't as big, but it led kind of to an interesting road because uh, it really led directly to what uh, we now see as the Arctic Council. Uh, it was initially uh, uh, founded as the Rovaniemi process in Finland. Uh, the Rovaniemi process led to the Arctic Environmental Protection Strategy, which uh, focused on Arctic environmental protection. And then, recognizing that this mechanism could be used for more than just the environment and environmental protection and environmental issues, it became the Arctic Council, which, as we know, deals with essentially everything in the Arctic, with the exception of of defense and military matters, which is excluded by its very definition in the terms of reference, and a few other things that are sort of not talked about because they generally don't lend themselves well to, uh, to, uh, to uh, broad or multilateral negotiations and are better off as sort of bilateral negotiations. So the Arctic Council, what does this, uh, this machine that we've built from this process look like? This is what it looks like right now. This is the Arctic Council structure today under the Finnish chairmanship. Um, this diagram will change here in May of 2019 when the Icelandic chairmanship takes over, but mostly it'll look pretty much the same. Uh, at the top, of course, is the ministers. Uh, these are the ministers of foreign affairs. Uh, in the case of the United States, it's the, our secretary of state. Uh, the, the senior Arctic officials are really the day-to-day -day managers of the Arctic Council work. Uh, and then the work itself is divided up into a number of groups the six working groups that are always active, uh, di divided uh, roughly along thematic lines. You've got uh, ocean issues under the protection of the Arctic Marine Environment Working Group. You've got uh, biodiversity in the Arctic under the conservation of Arctic flora and fauna. You've got uh, the Sustainable Development Working Group, which really looks at all sort of the human activities in the Arctic, and, and on and on and on. And all of these groups have done a lot of amazing work on Arctic issues and have produced a lot of really amazing uh, uh, reports, findings, and recommendations. Now, in addition to the governments, there's two other elements of the Arctic Council that I think are pretty significant. One is the inclusion of observers, and the observers are divided uh, uh, into three categories. One is non-Arctic states, and of course, in this room, we've got representatives of a number of non-Arctic state observers. Uh, they're also divided into intergovernmental organizations, and, uh, and of course, intergovernmental organizations have a strong role to play, but then they're also, the third category is non-governmental organizations, and so these are, uh, uh, run a wide gamut of, of types of organizations, everything from industry-based organizations to civil society and environmental organizations. But what may be most important about the Arctic Council is the role of the permanent participants, and you've heard about them before. There's six organizations representing the indigenous peoples of the Arctic, and the important thing to keep in mind about the permanent participants is that they sit at all these tables. They sit at the ministerial table, they sit at the senior Arctic officials table, they sit at all the tables. So you're not talking about eight Arctic states, you are talking about eight Arctic states and six permanent participants organizations. There are 14 chairs at that table, and that's the way it works in the Arctic Council. Um, there uh, are benefits and uh, challenges to all this, uh, but in general, I think this model has proven itself to be a very, very good one, and the input of the indigenous people of the Arctic into all of this is really, really uh, essential. So what has all this led to? Well, it's led to a lot. 
uh, over the course of, uh, of the time since 1996 when the Arctic Council was founded. Um, uh, groundbreaking uh, uh, reports such as the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment, uh, the Arctic Marine Shipping Assessment. Um, the Arctic Marine Shipping Assessment was, uh, was uh, released in 2009. To this day, we are still working from it. And we'll continue to work from it because it really delineated what we need to be looking at in terms of Arctic marine activities. But there's been a wide variety of other things. There's been uh, three legally binding instruments, including the, the Agreement on Cooperation on Marine Oil Pollution Preparedness Response in the Arctic, which was ably co-chaired by Ambassador David Balton, who's in this room. Um, there are numerous Arctic Council declarations. Every two years we have a new one. The most recent was uh, the Fairbanks Declaration. Um, uh, there are interesting projects that really deal very specifically with the, with the people of the Arctic, and one under pain right now is called Marine, uh, Meaningful Engagement of Indigenous Peoples and Local Communities in Marine Activities that looks at how do we engage with, uh, with communities and indigenous peoples on all of this uh, 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 work and activity. And in fact, there have been amazing things like the Ialu cookbook. Um, the Ialu uh, project was uh, under the Sami Council with numerous partners. Uh, it's a cookbook, but it's also about indigenous youth, Arctic change, and culture. And uh, recently, uh, earlier in 2018, it uh, won an award from Gourmand Magazine, and uh, I, I urge you to check this out. It's, uh, it's an unusual but amazing example of what can happen when Arctic cooperation uh, really involves everybody. So um, the Arctic Council uh, uh, puts all this together, and I think one of the reasons why all of this is so significant is because it does also include the traditional knowledge of indigenous peoples uh, at at a, quite a high level. And I remember many of you who know Bob Carell and his work on the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment. Um, when this work was happening, Bob often talks about how hard he had to try to convince uh, some of the co-leads on the ASEA that really we have to include traditional knowledge in this. We have to have uh, the indigenous people of the Arctic involved at a very high level. Many of those people thought that that was a, not worth the time, B, it was anecdotal information, C, it didn't men, uh, meld well with science, and Bob uh, uh, will say, he asked them to give him a year. He said, let's get into this a year. If, if it's not paying off, if it's not uh, useful, then I'll uh, rethink it. And he, he said, uh, after that year, there wasn't a single complaint. Everybody was convinced. And I think that's a great example that if you give it the time and if you give it the resources, uh, every project, every report, every two pagers I've ever been involved with that it really genuinely involved the voices of indigenous peoples and Arctic communities was better for it. So where else though does this cooperation happen on Arctic issues, particularly on Arctic maritime issues? And of course, one of those places in the, is at the International Maritime Organization. This is an interesting compare and contrast. Um, the Arctic Council being an organization that was really founded because uh, of the idea that, hey, we need to get on top of things and really prevent them from happening, and the earlier we talk about it, the better. Of course, the IMO uh, was initially founded in response to a lot of disasters that were happening, uh, life at sea disasters, environmental disasters, and so uh, founding the IMO was a bit of a different process, and you can think of the IMO as sort of being structured similarly. There's sort of an overarching body. There's a secretariat. There's a number of committees that deal with issues uh, roughly along thematic lines. But instead of eight countries, you're dealing with 174 flag states. Uh, you're dealing with uh, a large number of NGOs and IGOs. And it's just a much bigger mechanism uh, operating under the U United Nations framework. And an important thing to note is that there is no consistent uh, uh, involvement of indigenous peoples and indigenous representation. Indigenous peoples are at the table. They might go as part of Canada's delegation. Canadian indigenous peoples might be there at the table and they might make important contributions. But uh, uh, administrations change, political climates change, and so that means that the next meeting, they might not be able to be there. Uh, I think there's been a number of NGOs that have uh, helped and worked to try to get indigenous peoples involved at the IMO, uh, but uh, to this day it, it, it has not resulted in consistent representation, but that is something that's being worked on, and again, I think the IMO will be better for it uh, having community voices at the table discussing matters that will affect them and their families and their communities. So, 
Let's look at, look at some examples of when this cooperation really works well. And one is a really recent one. And uh, this one I, uh, is pretty close to my heart. It's, uh, it's uh, the development of routing measures between the, in the Bering Strait uh, between Alaska and the Russian Federation. Um, and uh, if you look at the, uh, the map, uh, uh, I guess it would be to your right, that is a, uh, a representation of what this looks like. There's a number of, of routes uh, that have been established at, at the International Maritime Organization. In, a number, in addition to those routes through the Bering Strait, there are also three areas to be avoided that have been uh, delineated around St. Lawrence Island, King Island, and uh, Unimac Island. And so those uh, areas to be avoided are, uh, they're not regulatory, they're not mandatory, they are just suggestatory. In other words, try to stay out of these areas if you possibly can. And what we found is that this really works well because mariners now know that in general they should try to stay out of those areas. They also know that, for instance, if they're in trouble, they need to be in lee of a storm or if they're in, they need to weather somewhere, all they got to do is let authorities know, hey, we're going to be in this area, uh, we'll be out as soon as we can, but here's the reasons why we're there. This has been really successful, uh, both the routing and the uh, areas to be avoided. And, and, and the really successful, there's successful examples of this in other places, including in the Aleutian chain where there are uh, also areas to be avoided that were recently put into force. So um, this process, uh, this all came about through a really uh, elaborate and in engaged and involved stakeholder process. And, and one of the things that went into the stakeholder process was the map on your left which was developed through a community process on the island, on St. Lawrence Island by the community of Gamble, who wanted to show where they are uh, doing their subsistence hunting activities. And so they worked with uh, an organization, it happened to be one I was working with at the time, Allied International Association, uh, developed this map. Uh, uh, we overlaid some, uh, some different vessel traffic uh, patterns on top of it to show what what's, had been happening in the area. Uh, the routes for fall 2004. That was data from the Arctic Marine Shipping Assessment that got overlaid on this. So this map was given to the United States Coast Guard as part of the process that developed the map on the right. And if you notice, around St. Lawrence Island, uh, which is the larger uh, yellow spot uh, on the upper part of the map on the right-hand side, well, that uh, it pretty clearly covers the areas that the community of Gamble thought ought to be made, uh, mariners be made aware of. So this process really, really worked. Now, that's not to say it was perfect and there weren't complaints. In actuality, the process at IMO was a little hit and miss. Uh, and and, and I, the story I like to tell is that the people who represented the Coast Guard at the IMO in London, they were not the people who sat around tables and talked to communities. And so when uh, the IMO asked the United States delegation, well, what was the stakeholder process? The people at the IMO really couldn't describe it very thoroughly because they weren't there. But you know who could describe it were the two indigenous individuals who were there at that table. And they said, we had a number of meetings, we had a number of opportunities to put uh, our information into the process and it really worked. And that's what made this uh, uh, approved in the IMO and that's why it will enter into force probably in about six months. So this is a real example of, uh, of a process that has worked well and it involved collaboration at, at both the high level but also at the community level. So let's look at another example. and uh, This is one I want to display for a couple of reasons. This is a project that's ongoing in the Arctic Council right now uh, by one of the six Arctic Council permanent participants. It's from Gwich'in Council International. So Gwich'in Council International or GCI represents Gwich'in people from Alaska and Canada. And they basically said, look, all of our communities are suffering from one thing. What are our communities spending money on uh, every single month that we can't afford to spend it on? And that is fuel, diesel fuel, to run their generators, to heat their communities. How can we fix this? So they decided that what was really needed was a tool, and not just for their communities, but for all Arctic communities. And so they are in the process of developing the, article, the Arctic Sustainable Energy Toolkit, and this toolkit will give every community the ability to both, A, assess their energy needs and their current energy uh, uh, situation, but B, transition away from uh, uh, expensive non-renewable energy towards something that's more economically viable and better for the environment. And 
this little project, which is in testing right now, it's uh, three communities in, on the Canadian side are testing this. This little project should have a lot of resources and it should be implemented Arctic-wide. I mean, every community in the Arctic that's off the road system, they ought to have this and they ought to be able to implement it. And so um, one of the things that I think is really important about what the Arctic Council does is that it allows uh, these sorts of tools to be built. And there's a lot of examples of projects that develop these kind of tools. Some are really close to my heart. Uh, some were with uh, our Elliott International Association collaborating with the Korea Maritime Institute to develop a mapping tool so that communities could map their use of the marine environment and not have to depend on a university or a government to come in and do it for them. So these kind of things are really important and they're really, really uh, uh, doable. They're, they don't cost very much and, and they, the, the returns on them are so, so valuable. So this is the sort of thing I think we should be, uh, we should really be supporting. So, some final thoughts here. There's a lot that happens at the Arctic Council and the IMO and, uh, and, um, and, and work on Arctic marine issues and other issues. It, they, they take place there and, 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 and it's important. And I think that w as the Arctic opens up, as we see more ship traffic, as we see more potential resource development, the Arctic Council is gonna grow in importance because that's where these things are gonna be discussed. So, indigenous organizations and, uh, and non-governmental organizations. And when I say NGOs, I'm primarily talking about civil society organizations and environmental organizations. They have access at both of these places, but it, to varying degrees. And um, uh, I think one of the things that we're likely to see is uh, more observers at the Arctic Council for the very reasons that I think the Arctic Council generally is gonna grow importance. You're gonna see more observers. We're up to, uh, uh, to uh, is it 30, 39, depending on how you count the EU. So uh, it's going to go up, and there's uh, applications in the hopper right now, and we're going to see uh, uh, a lot more observers at the Arctic Council. Okay, the, the active engagement of indigenous peoples on Arctic issues, that's really, really important as for the reasons that I've just discussed. And it's important that they be able to represent themselves and speak with their own voice. It's important that they not have strings attached to their support or that they feel uh, uh, fettered uh, by uh, uh, attending a meeting with somebody else's organization. And so uh, the gains from having um, uh, well-represented and completely independent indigenous peoples uh, are many, including indigenous knowledge, including their role in innovation and the experience that they bring to, uh, on adaptation and resilience. People, the Arctic indigenous people have been living in the Arctic for millennia. They have experienced profound change, not just now, but many times. And they know how uh, to be resilient and they know how to adapt and all we have to do is listen to them. Now NGOs bring expertise and resources that we might not be able to find anywhere else. I think it's really important to realize that if you're gonna talk about public-private partnerships, you have to have uh, NGOs included as well as part of that because they are doing research and they are spending resources on these questions. And again, you just have to ask them and we shouldn't be afraid of what they say because it is their role to push the envelope. It is their role to say, hey, can't we take this one step further? Can't we make uh, 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 things a bit cleaner? Can't we uh, uh, process, or, uh, transition to renewable energy sooner? That is their role and it's an important one and we need to hear their voices. So opportunities to make these mechanisms work, to support them, to listen to them, they ought to be augmented. We ought to be thinking about that all the time. I know there's people in this room that are thinking about it all the time. We've heard from some of them, uh, but let's keep these things in mind and uh, thanks very much for listening.